All right, here we go. Final stretch of this chapter, part three. That's it. So we were going to talk about how there are situations in which the rules of inheritance that Mendel discovered go right out the window. So let's go into the realm of weird. So not everything is simple Mendelian inheritance. One of the things we see is incomplete dominance. In incomplete dominance, uh, for instance, seen in snapdragons, neither allele is fully dominant over the other. So you won't get that situation where the dominant allele completely covers up the recessive allele. In snapdragons, we have red versus white. For convenience's sake, we'll call red capital R and white lowercase r, even though neither is truly dominant over the other. Well, what does it mean when neither is truly dominant over the other? Uh, if you're homozygous red, your flower is red. If you're homozygous white, your flower is white. But when you're heterozygous, you get a blending. Both red and white are expressed, so the phenotype is pink, a blend of red and white. Both colors are expressed. So in incomplete dominance, the phenotype is a combination of both different alleles. Blood type is another good example of incomplete dominance. You can have A, B, A, B, or O blood types. A and B are protein markers that are governed by uh, Mendelian inheritance. Uh, o is the absence of protein markers, by the way. So uh, your gene can be this little IA, IB, or I with no protein on there. It's your O. Um, and so if you have two alleles for IA, your blood type A. Two alleles for IB, blood type B. If you have IA and IB, your red blood cells show both A and B proteins. And then if you have IO, uh, if you're homozygous for IO, then your red blood cells have zero proteins on them. So kind of neat how that works. So incomplete dominance, wrenching the gears. Next up, pleiotropy. Pleiotropy is where one gene affects many phenotypes. Here's our poor little frizzle chicken. Uh, that is literally the name for this breed. The frizzle chicken looks kind of like it got electrocuted recently. Frizzle chickens have a single gene that can affect a large number of different phenotypes. The feathers curl outwards on the frizzle chicken, but at the same time, it has abnormal body temperatures. It has higher metabolic rates. It has higher blood flow rates, greater digestive capacity. It lays fewer eggs. These are all separate phenotypes that are all altered by the single dominant frizzle gene. So uh, that is pleiotropy. One single gene affects a large number of phenotypes. Uh, I want you to know what pleiotropy is. Possibly know that a frizzle chicken is an example. The frizzle gene is an example of pleiotropy. But I don't think I necessarily need you to remember all the phenotypic alterations the frizzle gene causes. So, Next up, polygenic inheritance. Polygenic inheritance is the opposite of pleiotropy. Pleiotropy is one gene, multiple phenotypes. Well, polygenic inheritance is many genes, one phenotype. So expression of a phenotype depends on how many genes you have. And how, basically adding together the genes. Opposite of pleiotropy. Skin color is a great example of polygenic inheritance because there are three separate genes coding for melanin production. Melanin production is dominant, so pigment. So the dominant of each of these three genes, we'll call them A, B, C, codes for melanin production. The color intensity depends on the number of dominant genes. So uh, the darkest skin colors will be produced by people who are homozygous dominant for all three genes. Uh, anyone who's heterozygous for any one of these genes starts showing lighter and lighter skin colors. Kind of neat. Uh, skin color is actually uh, uh, sort of a 
defense against ultraviolet radiation. Uh, the more pigment you have, the more melanin you have in your skin, uh, the more you resist ultraviolet radiation. However, you also reduce the amount of sunlight reaching your cells. And sunlight is vital in vitamin D production. So, what does this matter? At the equator, you get large, ridiculously large amounts of sunlight. So, it's way better to have lots of melanin because you're going to get enough sun for vitamin D production, even if your melanin pigment is maxed out. However, when you go north or south of the equator, due to the curvature of the Earth, you start reflecting more sunlight away. And so people there, in order to keep up their vitamin D production, need uh, to have less melanin in their skin. They need to be able to absorb more light. So you see this sort of gradual change in skin color based on your uh, longitude, whether you're north or south. So if you're at the poles, you're going to see people with the lightest skin colors. And as you move towards the equator, skin color is just going to gradually get darker and darker and darker. And that's just purely due to the interplay between uh, ultraviolet radiation and vitamin D production. And it's governed by three genes that code for melanin. And that is it. Just melanin production. Bam. So if anyone tells you skin color is, you know, indicative of anything besides three genes that code for melanin, you have my express permission to slap them in the face. All right. Now it's time to bust into something slightly different from Mendelian inheritance, and that's when we talk about inheritance on the chromosomal level. So Mendelian genetics talked about alleles being the genetic unit. Well, we know that the genetic unit of life is DNA, it is a single gene, not an allele. We also know that you carry your genes on chromosomes. So the locus or location of a gene is on the chromosome. And so it is the chromosomes that are inherited, not the genes. So this leads us to the chromosome theory of inheritance. Uh, and so, instead of the law of segregation applying to single alleles, the law of segregation applies to chromosomes. So in Mendelian genetics, mom and dad can only contribute a single allele for a given trait. In chromosomal genetics, um, because there can be many alleles on a single chromosome, uh, it's the chromosome and all its alleles that are segregated. Mom or dad can only donate a single chromosome and all the alleles associated with that single chromosome. So that's pretty easy. So let's talk about humans. Uh, let's talk about recessive genetic disorders again. So in this case we're going to mention color blindness as a recessive genetic disorder. Um, and we're going to do a little test cross. We have a colorblind mom and a normal dad, a normal seeing dad. Uh, and we want to find out how color blindness is inherited. Uh, in other words, we want to find out dad's genotype. Well, all we got to do is a test cross. So let's go to our Punnett squares. What do we expect if dad is homozygous dominant? Well, homozygous dominant times uh, mom who has color blindness, which is recessive, you get all heterozygotes. None of the children are expressing color blindness. However, if dad is heterozygous, then when we look at our Punnett square, 50% of the kids should have color blindness, 50% should have normal vision. So if we have a 50-50 ratio, do we know dad's genotype? I hear you saying heterozygous. Well, guess what? I'm messing with you because this is screwy. So the wrench in the works is that when you have a normal sighted father uh, and a colorblind mother, uh, you do see the 50-50 ratio. But that 50-50 ratio is all sons colorblind, 
all daughters normal scene. <coughs> and that is sort of a what situation. WTF? Well, what sex chromosome does dad give to his children? Hmm? So, what chromosomes does a man have for sex? That's right, XY. So, uh, which of the two, mom or dad, was able to donate a Y chromosome? That's right, dad. Uh, so, what chromosome did you get from mom? The X chromosome. So, all sons are colorblind, and this is because colorblindness is inherited on the X chromosome. Because daughters get an X chromosome from dad and an X chromosome from mom, they get dad's normal scene X chromosome. So the daughters become carriers. Uh, whereas the sons, they are all colorblind. So some genes are only carried on an X chromosome, some genes only carried on a Y chromosome. Color blindness is an X-linked gene. So let's look at other X-linked recessive disorders. Hemophilia is an X-linked recessive disorder. Hemophilia is a bleeding disorder in which you don't produce the platelets necessary to clot wounds. Someone with hemophilia, hemophilia can bleed to death from a very, very small wound. Even a paper cut is dangerous to someone with hemophilia and this is X-linked. So uh, color blindness, muscular dystrophy also X-linked. Hemophilia is known as the royal disease. Uh, it's X-linked and uh, Queen Victoria of England, her kids expressed hemophilia. Um, and royal families are often developed, uh, often produced diplomatic relations, allies uh, with other countries, uh, by marrying off their kids. So when Queen Victoria married her kids off to other royal families, she married off hemophilia to other royal families. And so you started to see hemophilia cropping up in royal families all over Europe. And that's why they called it the royal disease. Just sort of a neat historical factor. Okay, how about Y-linked recessive disorders? Well, it's not much here. We've got hypertrichosis of the pinna. That's pretty cool. That must be some crazy disorder, right? Right? It's excessively hairy ears. Like, ridiculously hairy ears. Uh, which kind of sucks because if you are a male and you have excessively hairy ears, you you have actual hypertrichosis of the pinna. Any son you have is going to have excessively hairy ears, any and all sons. Because remember, a father donates his Y chromosome to his son in order to make them male. So that kind of sucks. But hey, at least none of your daughters will have excessively hairy ears. Uh, and then pretty much besides hypertrichosis of the pinna, you get sex differentiation disorders. In other words, problems developing uh, your sexual characteristics. Um, and that's uh, basically all due to mutations in something called the TDF gene. The TDF gene is a single gene that appears to play a vital role in making a fetus male. If the TDF gene is present, it activates the biological pathways that lead to development as a male. If your TDF gene has a mutation and doesn't work quite right, you're not gonna, you know, either you're not gonna become fully male or you're not gonna become fertile, you're gonna have problems with testicular development, things like that. Why so few things on the Y chromosome? Eh, the Y chromosome is teeny tiny. It's practically useless beyond making you male. So, Y chromosome doesn't do anything besides making you male and apparently giving you ridiculously hairy ears. Hooray! 
Okay, uh, last concept is going to be linked genes. Linked genes are when we have two genes that, oh, wait, no, this is the second to last concept. Anyway, two genes are where we have uh, two genes that are linked are very, very close together on the chromosome. So, they, you know, their location on the chromosome is very close. And we call them linked genes, uh, not because there's some kind of physical linkage between the two genes, but because they tend to be inherited. Remember, the chromosome segregates, not the individual genes. So when two genes are on the same chromosome, they segregate together. And when they're linked, they tend to be inherited together, even though crossing over occurs all the dang time. So they're linked genes because they're inherited together. And it's not a physical link. Rather, they're so close together on the chromosome that it's extremely rare for crossing over to separate them. Remember, crossing over causes, you know, part of the chromatid to break off and recombine with a uh, different uh, chromosome. So um, when they're linked genes, they're so close together that it's highly unlikely that crossing over will separate them. Lastly, we talk about recombinants. This is super easy. Uh, recombination is just when DNA breaks loose and binds back to something. So what you need to know about recombinations or recombinant chromosomes, well, that's the result essentially of crossing over. Crossing over breaks cr pieces of chromosomes loose and then they bind back to uh, a, a separate chromosome. Whether it's the homologous pair or otherwise, they bind to DNA. And so that creates a recombinant chromosome.